Good morning. morning. Is that a great time of worship or what? That's so good. God is good. Amen. (laughs) Give the Lord a clap. I tell you, I really been, the Lord has been doing, you know, for those of you who don't know, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer a couple weeks ago or a month ago. And God, you know, I don't know about you guys, but you never say, hey, this would be a great time for cancer. But I want to just say, as I'd been preaching a couple months before that about that, Romans 8, 28, about God works all things together for good to those who love him. And I realize that even though cancer is not good, God has been working it for good in our lives. Amen? Amen. And uh, my wife has been just doing an amazing job. I've, she is more encouraged than we are, you know, so I mean, just uh, you can give her a clap there. But it's really brought our family together. It's amazing, you know, I kind of, I really see this as like I kind of want to make the devil angry that he allowed this and that it's working for good. But uh, I tell you, it's made me see how much that the real gift or the real power of God is love, amen? The greatest gift is love, and we need to have that. And we need to love God, and then we need to love each other because that's how they'll know you're my disciples. And, and I love it because I tend to be a guy who kind of speaks against liberalism in the sense of the liberal church accepting all things and just saying, you know, homosexuality is cool and everything's cool. But how many know this? I, I heard a saying, and I really like it, just hit me this morning. It says, love or, or, or truth without love is legalism. Amen? But... Love without truth is liberalism. Amen? So we need a balance. We need to have truth and love. Love and truth. We can't have one or the other, but both. And we need to speak the truth in love. And how we know it is the most loving thing to speak the hard things. But it's a matter of how we do it. Do we speak to condemn or do we speak to say, hey, God loves you despite your sin. And the Lord reminded me that it's his kindness It leads us to repentance. It wasn't, hey, you're going to go to hell. It was his love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us. And I remember that. I used to walk around. I first got saved. And I know you hate to hear my stories, but I don't care. It's my story. But I I said this. I used to say to people, God loves me. People go, he loves me too. And I go, no, but he really loves me. I'm a jerk. I was a drug dealer. I was terrible. But God loves me. And how many know that's all of us should say that? All of us have sinned and fallen short. You might not have been a drug dealer, but I know God loves you, and you should always have joy. Why would God pursue me? Right? We always say, why doesn't God love me more? Why does God allow this? But we should be saying, why did God choose me? Why did God draw me? And that should bring joy to you right there, that God would pursue you when you weren't pursuing him. Amen? And the Lord, as I said, spoke to my heart and says, Craig, it was my love that drew you. It was my love that touched you. Now, Allow my love to flow through you to touch others. How many know that is the gospel? As you have been blessed, now tell others. Tell others about the goodness of God that he loves and forgives sinners to those that will turn to him. Amen? That was all free right there. So let's get to All right, Daniel chapter 1, verse 20. Daniel chapter 1, verse 20. How many are you enjoying the book of Daniel? I love the book of Daniel. Really good. I love the word of God, but this is a great book too. The title of today's message is The Troubling Dream, A a Troubling Dream. As we saw last week in our study of Daniel, that Daniel had given himself completely, and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had completely given themselves to God to honor him. They wouldn't eat the king's food that had been sacrificed to idols because they would have it was it was it would have defiled them. So they said, We're not gonna do it. And God, we saw if you if you didn't get the the CD, then you can listen to it online. But uh, if you weren't here last week, but hear this, the verse I want you to hear, and I've said this verse a thousand times, but I think it's worth repeating a thousand times till we really believe it. And it's first Samuel two thirty. And it says, I will honor those who honor me. Amen? I believe the reason why America is as great as it is is because of men that honored and women who honored him. Amen? But now we're sort of pulling away from that, and the sad part of that verse continues to say, and I will lightly esteem those who lightly esteem me. And are we not seeing that in America? And I want to tell you, not to condemn you, but to encourage you as a church, as you worship the Lord today, As you felt the presence of God, now worship him all the time and esteem him highly and honor him highly. And he promises 
that he will honor those, those families, those people, you, who honor him. How many want to honor the God, uh, Lord more? I want to honor God. And we want, and we should, you know, as election year, we should be praying for people, godly men and women, to rise up who want to honor God again. And we should vote biblical values. Anyway, God came through for Daniel and his friends mightily. And as I said last week, you can't outgive God. If you're a tither, if you're someone who gives to God, you know that. You can't outgive God. Amen. God will be a debtor to no man. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gave themselves wholeheartedly or fully to the Lord. And what happened? God gave them favor. He gave them favor with the eunuch that was over them to change his diet because he was worried about losing his head. He also gave him favor, as we're going to see today, with a king that was ungodly. And as we learned last week, if a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, the Proverbs says, he'll make even his enemies to live at peace with him. How many know we could use that too? We got some enemies who want to kill the great Satan. That's us, they call us. And how many know we need that? But how do you get that? Because our ways need to be honoring and pleasing to the Lord. And he promises that he'll make even our enemies to live at peace with us. Well, hear this. I, I love this saying. I said it again. This is kind of a recap of last week. It's, I love this saying. I think it was from Warren Wearsby. He said that if we as Christians would only give over and above our reasonable service, if we give over and above our reasonable service, then the Lord would give over and above his usual blessing. How many would like to have over and above the usual blessing of God? Then God asks you in love that as you have been loved by him, now in love, give yourself completely to him. And when you give yourself completely to him and fully, he promises to bless. He promises to provide. He promises to take care of all your needs. And we're going to see that today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the sweet time of your presence. Thank you for worship. Lord, as worship, one of the best definitions I ever heard was worship is love responding to love. As you have loved us, now we give back that love to you. And so, Lord, I just thank you. I pray we continue to worship you as we study your word, that we would want to know your heart. We want to know what pleases you. We want to know what displeases you. We want to know how to honor you in everything we do. So, Father God, I ask that right now you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Empower me, Lord. May anything I might say that is not of you be silenced right now. But everything that I would say that's from your word and from your spirit, that, Lord, you would speak powerfully through me, that I would be your mouthpiece, as it says in Peter. And I pray right now for every person listening, whether it be in this room or out in the foyer or on the internet, I ask, oh God, that you would open their spiritual ears and you'd open their spiritual eyes and soften their heart that they would say, Lord, Lord, as long as this is of you, as long as this is true, I want it. I want all of you. And so, Lord, speak. Can you say that to the Lord? Speak to me, Lord. Speak, Lord. And so, Father, we love you and we just give you this time and we ask that you would speak to us powerfully and may we never be the same from this day forward. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Daniel chapter 1, verse 20. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, he found them, hear this, ten times better, ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. Verse 21. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Daniel was probably about 15 years old at the time when he was captured by, by King Nebuchadnezzar or the Babylonians. He lived until he was about 85, 90. So he spent the entire, his entire life in Babylonian captivity. And so, you know, talk about someone who could have been angry and hurt, but instead he thrived even in the midst of a hard time. But because the favor of God was on Daniel's life, Daniel was put, hear this, in a place of leadership in a place of service, even in an evil kingdom with an evil king. Isn't that amazing? We think we should only fr thrive in good places, but here Daniel, because he honored God, because he got, put God first, he thrived even in a harsh place, a captivity, a, a place where it was pagan worship. He thrived in that place. And again, because he put God first 
And as I said, God honors, as the word says, God honors those who honor him and put him first. You know, we all want to be successful. How many, how many like to be successful? Does anyone say, I don't want to be? We all want to be successful, right? And Jesus doesn't put that down. As long as the success is a godly success, if it's a success for self and worldliness, then no. But if you want to be successful, remember they said, hey, can my one son sit on your right hand of the father and the other on the left? And Jesus didn't put it down. He just said, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And the mom goes, oh, and the guy's, yeah, sure. And he goes, well, no, you will drink my cup, but you don't quite know what that means. It means dying to yourself and dying to your selfishness and self-will and self-rule. But sadly, all of us want to be successful, but sadly, a lot of us put the second things, hear this, second things in life first, and the first, things in li- and the first thing in life last. Amen? A lot of times we put the second most important things in life first, and we put the first thing last. Do we not? We say, Lord, when I get this and this and this, then I'll seek you. But the Lord says, the Lord says through Matthew 6, 33, he says, seek, Jesus said, seek first or seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously or live right before God. And he, what? Will give you everything you need. Isn't that amazing? We got everything backwards. We say, seek Seek success, seek money, seek power, seek whatever, you know, pleasure, seek, seek, seek. But the Lord says, seek me first, put me first, and I promise that all these needs that you need will will be supplied. Isn't that amazing? He says the pagans chase after money, they chase after food, they chase after housing, they chase after clothing. But he says, but you're not to be like that. And how many can say, I kind of do that? especially in this economy, don't we? We get a little nervous. But God says, if you'll seek me first, I promise you'll put me, the number one thing first, all the secondary things will be taken care of. How, how many like that? But guess what? Can we be honest that sometimes life happens and we go, but Lord, I got it, my job. I want to seek you, but. I'm trying. How many know as a pastor, it's kind of weird that as a pastor, sometimes I can get so busy with the ministry that I don't put God first. Isn't that kind of ironical, as I always love? That's my new word, ironical. It's kind of weird that my whole job is to put God first, but sometimes I can put the ministry even above God. And God's saying, no, put me first, and I'll take care of the ministry. Amen? God is no respecter of persons, it says in Acts 10, 34. So this same truth that was true for Daniel is the same that will be true for us if we will commit to honor him and commit to put him first. Amen? And I'll tell you, have you noticed there's some distractions in your life? I love my phone. I love to read. I have my Bible app on my phone. I have everything. But how many know with that phone comes the enemy can go, meh, biz, buzz, ring, hey, how you doing, text. How many know I love and hate my phone at the same time? But I now I've gotten smarter. Now I have a phone and then I have an iPad or the little, what do you call it, tablet. So I don't have a phone on that. I have a few prompts, but I've eliminated most of that. So now I just have my Bible app. How many know there is a way around these things? But when you just read on your phone, how many know that phone can be easily a distraction? And the man or woman of God, when you're seeking the Lord, you need to try to eliminate as many distractions as possible. Second Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 16.9 is one of my favorite verses. I always say every verse is my favorite verse, but this one I really, really like. It says, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth. That means it's searching this whole church right now, just searching right now. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Isn't that encouraging? The Lord is searching. He's like a talent guy. He's looking for any man or woman to strengthen whose heart is fully committed to him. I want to ask you this. Is there anyone here who could use strength? Yeah, most of us. Anyone here could use encouragement? Yeah, there you go. And what does the Bible say? Then what do you have to do? Fully commit yourself to him. Fully committed to him. If you're fully committed to him, how many of God is fully committed to you? He's drawn us. Most of us here are saved. But now that we're saved, how many know there's a discipline of putting him first? Because it's easy to get distracted. We have a lot of times a wrong image of God the Father. 
We think that whoever gives himself, his life fully to God or gives himself wholeheartedly to God, that they're going to miss out and, and be miserable. You've heard the saying, and I, I kind of hate this saying, but it says, don't be so heavenly minded you're no earthly good. I can't remember, I don't know if it's Francis C.C. said that, but how many know, I believe the Bible teaches, be truly heavenly minded, and that's the only time you'll really be of any earthly good. Amen? You know, because that's what the Bible's saying. Seek first my kingdom, put me first, and then I'll take all the earthly things. I'll take care of all your earthly things. But to believe that if we put God first, we're going to miss out or be miserable, nothing could be farther from the truth. And the enemy says that because he doesn't want us to live, as Jesus said, that life and that life more abundantly. Jesus said, if you, hear this, being evil, how many can admit you're kind of evil sometimes, right? If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, now let me ask you that. If your child is really saying, Mom, Dad, my whole heart is to be committed to you and do what you say, how many of you are going to go, ah, you're not getting anything for Christmas? You're going to bless that child, right? You know what I mean? What do these people say? Why aren't you more like your brother, right? Don't you say that because you're the good child. You want to bless those who love you and who respect you, who encourage you. And if you being evil do that, how much more... Your heavenly father, right? And then he goes on to say what? If you being evil, give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to you? God wants to bless you. God wants you to prosper. And I don't mean Lear Jets, but he wants you to be successful. He wants you to be like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to where you can thrive even in an evil, crazy world. Does anyone work in an evil, crazy place? Raise your hand. Anyone? One per okay, one person. You guys lie. But we work in hard places. But God says you, greater is he who's in you. You should be able to be the head and not the tail. Christ in you should make you successful there if you're fully committed to him. I'm not going to say that you'll never have struggles, but how many know you should be able to overcome those struggles with the Lord? Those who love God and serve him with all their heart will be blessed, and he will bless your life immensely. He really, really will if you'll put him first. Notice here, too, that they were much better, ten times better than all the magicians, all the astrologers. And how many of you, how many of you today believe 1 John 4, 4, that says the spirit, or I like the New Living, says the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Or greater is he who's in you than he is in the world. How many know that? Greater is he who's in you. Sometimes we think the devil is a little greater than he really is. Now hear this. If you're standing by yourself against the devil, then, you, then he is greater and he's going to wipe you out. But how many know if you're in Christ, walking with Christ, putting him first, how many know the devil doesn't stand a chance when you're walking with the Lord? Because greater is he, Christ, the Holy Spirit, greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. And you need to know that and you need to believe that. i never forget how this one time I saw this. I, I was newly charismatic and I was teaching and I was Baptist and then I got charismatic. So I just finally realized that, you know, we have some authority in the Christ. And this, this guy came up right in the aisle and just was like, like this. And I'm like, whoa, you know, kind of freaked out. And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you. That man fell face down on the, well, he didn't fall face down. He fell on his knees and just and raised his hands up like this, right, and thing. And everyone's like thinking it was a skit or something. And I'm like, and I just sat there kind of, oh, is there anything more? What are we going to do? And, and, then, so, and then they got ushers, take him out and minister to him. But I mean, how many know that is the greatness of God? That wasn't me. That was Jesus. That's how powerful. But guess what? So a lot of us don't know that greater is Christ. We know it, but we don't really walk that we that Christ in us should be greater, that we should be, have more wisdom than any astrologer, Amen. more wisdom than any sage, more wisdom than any new age person. We should have more wisdom because we have God Almighty living in us. Amen. I love Romans 12, 21. It also says this, and this is a verse I love. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How I many know a lot of times, I'll sad to say, I can be overcome by evil. Amen. Can anyone say that sometimes? I get discouraged. I was driving here today. Don't you love bicyclists? Do you know, I, I love, you know, I, I live in Orr Valley, and there's so many bicyclists, but I just love when they feel like they're a car. And they drive in the middle of the road. You know, this guy was just driving in the middle of the road, and there's cars. I'm like, dude, we got places to go. I mean, I, I, mean, I want it. Thank God I'm a Christian. That's all I can say. Because, I mean, I just, you know I mean, I just want to do a little bump. I want to do a little, I am. You know, I'm like, come. 
come on, man. There's plenty of shoulder, but he's, I'm a car. And he's going, but I drive like a car that go 45 miles an hour. But uh, I got issues, okay? But um, I can get mad. Here I'm coming to church, blessing God. I'm like, come on, let's move. Praise the Lord. You know what I mean? And, uh, but all I know, I kind of laugh going, I think that's the enemy trying to mess with me. And we need to sort of see that. Oh, oh, yeah, I get it. Evil tried to overcome me, get me in a bad mood, get me angry. So you know what I mean? I can't really preach. as I'm not as open to the spirit as I should be. But we need to see that. That, that, that evil is going to try to mess with you, but Christ in us is greater, so we should be able to overcome that evil with good. You know, when someone cuts you off and then gives you the one-way sign, right? You should be able to say, oh, bless you in Jesus' name. Just bless them, Lord. And I just touch that person. That person needs the love of Jesus. Not, oh, come on. You know what I mean? You know. Morgan does that. I don't do that, but Morgan does that. <clears throat> Turn with me, if you would, to chapter 2 now of Daniel. Chapter 2 here has been called the backbone of prophecy, of Bible prophecy. Daniel chapter 2 unlocks the rest of the prophecies of the book. And Daniel, which in turn unlocks the prophecies, if you study Revelation ever, the book of Revelation, you know that a lot of it's from, you need to know Daniel because a lot of it, the abomination of desolation comes from Daniel. So you need to understand Daniel to really understand the book of Revelation. So it unlocks that too. For a good handle on eschatology, which is just a fancy word for the study of the end times, you need to be thoroughly familiar with the book of Daniel and especially chapter two here. So we're gonna study it. Verse one. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. The Bible says the sleep of the righteous is sweet. You know, a lot of times I don't get good sleep. I have a Fitbit now. That's why I'm wearing this purple weird thing. But I have a Fitbit, and it tells me what I love about it, besides telling me when my heart goes, but what I like about it is it monitors my sleep. And I was seeing before I got this, they say if you don't get at least seven hours of sleep, you, you, your health, your chance of sickness goes up through the roof. I average about probably five hours of sleep. How I many of that's not good? And that's why sometimes when I'm talking, you'll see me, I go, who am I? What, what was I saying? You know, and, and they say it needs time for your mind to, to, to kind of refile everything. And so a lot of times I just walk around. I mean, I just don't know who I am, and that's not real good, especially when you're a pastor, when you just start preaching, you go, and and you don't know what you're saying, you know what I mean? That's why you hear me say something, what was I saying? And you go, I don't know, it wasn't making any sense, but anyway. But psychologists tell us that 90% of a a person's free mental time, that time not devoted to a specific activity, is spent wondering and worrying about the past, or it's spent worrying and fretting about the future. And this was true of King Nebuchadnezzar. Hear this, guys. I want to say this to you. This really hit me. Remember when Jesus said, he said, don't worry about tomorrow, or that way, tomorrow, but worry about today. today. Don't worry, but be concerned with today. Hear this, guys. Have you ever been talking to someone and they're just you talking to someone? Hey, how you doing? They're like, have you ever seen that when people are just staring off into empty space? You're kind of like, hey, who are, where are you? Most of the time, I believe what that is is because we're either thinking about the past of what we shouldn't have done. Oh, I wish I hadn't done this. I, I wish I hadn't said that. I, I wish, and we live in regret in the past. Anyone ever been there? Yeah. Then, or we worry about the future. There's nothing to worry about. Our economy is strong, so you have nothing to worry about. Right? And we worry about, oh, what's going to happen with my 401k? Oh, should I even have a 401k? Oh, ah, hey. Right? And we live in the future, and, we're like, and then we're sparing off this way. Right? But Jesus says, be in today. You know, not, not, not like the world says, live for today. Don't care. About, it's not saying you don't plan for tomorrow, but you live right now. How many, how many know when you talk to somebody, it's good to actually be there? You know what I mean? Sometimes I'll talk to people, hey, yeah, and I'm on autopilot, like pa- auto pastor. Yes, hello, how you doing? God bless you. I just told you I'm dying. Hey, well, praise the Lord. Okay, I gotta go. You know what I mean? That's, that's not good. It's good to be there. And how you be there is you don't live in the past with regret. You put that under the blood. And you don't live in the future worrying. You trust that God will provide. Because why? Because you seek him first. And he promises, I'll provide. If he can feed Elijah out in the middle of the desert with a raven, how many know he can feed? He's going to need a big bird for me. But how many know he could do it? 
And we need to believe that. And God has always provided. Sometimes I'll freak out, you know. Sometimes, you know, the offerings are low. But the Lord's like, when have I not provided? Now, don't let somebody go, see, and I'm not going to tie it to test that for you. No. But, you know, how when you know God provides? Hasn't he come through? Amen. And usually if he doesn't, it's because we've done something really foolish, right? Bought a bunch of lottery tickets or something. And we should, God said, I didn't tell you to do that, right? But how many know God promises to, to, to provide for you. So live in that peace. You honor God, you don't have to worry, you don't have to be locked in the past, put it under the blood, confess it, deal with it. If you've hurt somebody, go to them, and you don't have to live in the future of worry. Verse two. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians and astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. Verse three. And the king said to them, I have had a dream. And my spirit is anxious to know the dream. These Chaldeans were schooled in ancient literature and writings of the culture. They were the wise men of the day. And they were the most educated men in, his, in Babylon. But now Nebuchadnezzar is demanding that they will tell him his dream. And hear this. This is where it gets hard. He's not going to tell them their dream. He's going to say, now, if you're really all that you say you are, because you say you know all things and you're wise men, you tell me my dream. So I know you're really that, you're wise. I mean, that's, that's going to put a little false prophet into some hardship, you know? Because anyone can kind of spin a dream you tell them. Yeah, I think that means, uh, you know, buy more stocks. I mean, you could say something, right? But when you don't know the dream, how are you going to spin it if you don't even know the dream? Verse 4. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. And this is kind of interesting real quick. Aramaic, the, the Bible's written in three languages. Hebrew. Greek, Hebrew is the Old Testament predominantly. Greek is the New Testament. And Aramaic is here. This is one of the only places in Aramaic. And it's written from chapter 2 to about 7 is in Aramaic. And Jesus spoke in Aramaic, so it's kind of cool. But it says, the, the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. And the king, O king, live forever. So they're kind of flattering, stalling for time. Tell your servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. At the end they're saying, tell us the dream. And we'll give you the interpretation. He's going to go, nope, not going to be that easy for you. Verse 5. Then the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you don't make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut into pieces. Wouldn't you love to be working for the king? And torn limb by limb, the New American Standard says. Hear this, guys. You want to hear this? I don't know if I can explain this right. I should have a visual, but you don't want to be that grossed out. But they used to do this. Here's this king. If you're, if you're not sure about capital, you know, say lethal injection so bad, listen to what this guy would do. He would take a tree's, and he'd make a square and have a tree like every about 15 feet apart on each corner of the square. Then he would tie the tops of the trees together and pull them tight together so they'd bend in. Then he would tie, he'd put a platform up, tie their arms or legs to the tree. Then he'd cut the rope and off would come their arms and legs. How many know if you see that once, you would say, oh, we better figure out some way, <laughs> make something up. I mean, you know, can you imagine this? That's what he's saying to them. He's saying this to them. And he says, then I will take your house. He'd usually kill your whole family and then make your house an ash heap. He'd just make it a burning rubble to say, here's what happens to those that disappoint the king. Verse six, however, if you tell me the dream, so he's saying this is what happens if you don't, but you tell me the dream and its interpretation, you should receive from me gifts, reward, great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. Now this isn't much pressure, is it? You know, you see, you know, I'm going to get my house burned to just an ash heap and my limbs torn off. And, wow, I wish I wasn't a false prophet right now. But anyways, that's what they're saying. They better not be false prophets or false interpreters, which they were. And because they, they can't tell the dream and they're kind of stalling for time. But hear this, most spiritists, and hear this real quick, there's only two powers in this world. There might be a million other religions. There might be spiritists, palm readers, Buddhists, every is, but there's only two powers in the world. Amen? There's either God or the devil. Now, the devil has lots of other names, right? All kinds of other things, anything that isn't God. But there's only two true supernatural powers. So a spiritist summons demonic spirits or the enemy to get so-called wisdom or understanding. So hear that. So these guys were basically, we'd simplify it. They're, they're called, you know, whatever, uh, what were they, astrologers and, and all kinds of things, but they're really spiritists. And they could seemingly put a powerful spin on a dream that someone told them, right? But to have 
to repeat that dream with never hearing it, how many know that person, you know, that they've never heard, that would be an amazing thing. And I want to tell you this real quick, just so you know this. When you, and hopefully you guys don't, but if you ever did or you know, you know that, call me now. Remember that girl, you know, you pay four ninety nine a minute or three ninety nine a minute to hear your, your future or fortune teller. You have and I have about as much accuracy as she does or he does. You can just guess, and you're pretty much accurate. You know, and they usually, don't you love them? They say, you're thinking about a letter B, no, C, E, G, F, H, I. You know, they just keep going through it, and the people help them out. I mean, hey, you should know my letter. And then they'll say things like this. I've sensed you've had pain in your life. No. You're a prophet. Amazing. I sense you've been discouraged ever. Have you ever had a discouraged? How did you know? Okay. I mean... Come on. I mean, these guys really don't tell you that much. But anyways, but Nebuchadnezzar says to them, if you guys are as wise as you say you are, you should be able to tell me not only the interpretation, but the dream itself. And here's the little pressure. Either tell me the dream or you guys are going to get ripped apart. But if you tell me it and you're right, then I will give you reward. But they're not going to be able to do it. Verse 7, they answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. And now King Nebuchadnezzar, did I stutter? No. Okay. Verse 8. That's the, new, that's the new message Bible. Verse 8. The, the king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time. He's, he's saying, you're stalling here. I know you're stalling. Because you see that my decision is firm. Verse 9. If you did not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words, meaning you're kind of trying to deceive me, before me. Tell me uh, the time, till the time has changed, meaning you're stalling for time. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. Meaning if you can tell me the dream, you're going to be able to tell me the correct interpretation. Verse 10, the Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is no man on earth. Hear that, there's no man on earth. And God's going to go, yes, there is. There is no man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chal Chaldean. Hear that. He's saying, you're a bonehead king. No one's ever asked this. They're trying to put it on him now. Verse 11, it's a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king. No other, hear that, now hear that, that's how awesome God is. No other can tell. They're saying, hey, this is impossible. Except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. The Chaldeans' response here was, what you're asking is impossible. There's not a man on earth that can do what you're asking. You're asking the impossible, you're being irrational. The king here reveals, I believe, his lack of confidence in his wise men. He's realizing these guys aren't as smart as they say. I think they're just you know, like that four ninety nine a minute. I'm getting ripped off. You know, this isn't right. And I'm pretty sure they must have failed him in previous occasions, said this was going to happen and didn't. So Nebuchadnezzar feels that these men have been feeding him a great deal of baloney. And he's now putting them to the test. He's testing to see that if they really are as spiritual and as true as they say they are. His reasoning at this point, as I said, is very logical. It's saying, if you can tell me the dream, then I, it's reasonable to conclude that the interpretation you would give me would be genuine and right also. But hear this. But if they can't, he's saying, if they can't tell me the, my dream, then the interpretation you would give me would probably be false. Satan can, know, can tell you your past. But how many know he cannot tell you your future? Amen? And I want to say this because it's amazing how many people in the church still do things like tarot cards and still do things like uh, astrology and read their horoscope. And how many know that's not a good thing? And the Bible speaks against it in Deuteronomy. But hear this. I have never gone to a palm reader or anything, but I have heard people that have, and I've prayed for a lot of people. But what happens is, what, what I've seen and heard and read, that they usually tell you something of your past. And then because they tell you something of your past that no one should have ever known, or you maybe never told anyone else, you go, oh, how could they know that? And then because they told you your past, then they speak something into your future. But they don't know your future. Hear me. What they'll tell you is something like this. Remember when you were 12 years old? 
and you snuck into your beloved grandma's purse and you took that $6 to get those gummy bears. Remember? A pound of them, but gummy bears. You remember that? You did that and you felt bad all this time. And you've never told a soul, oh, right? You go, oh, how could they know? Oh my goodness, she's, this is a prophetess. You know why they know? Because they were the ones tempting you to do that. Just like we have godly angels that watch over us, the Bible says. That he'll give charge to his little angels to watch over us. There's also demonic spirits that watch. Have you read the screw tape letters from C.S. Lewis? There's demonic spirits that follow you and, and kind of go with you. So what happens, the spirit just summons that demon and says, hey, what do we have on this person? The spirit tells them that if they're real, if they're not making up, if they really are demonic, then the spirit tells them and then they go, whoa. And then what happens is the demonic then tries to say something in the future. And a lot of times it's usually something negative. You're going to die or you're going to whatever. Something's going to happen. And guess what? That spirit doesn't know that's going to happen, but that spirit's going to try to make that happen. Amen? Do you get it? Satan is not all-powerful. He's not all-knowing. He's not omniscient. He's not, um, he's not, uh, he does not all-knowing. He doesn't know everything. He just knows the past. Only God and godly men and women can tell the future because God has spoken it to them. Amen? That's what, God makes, that's what makes God's word so special, so incredible, is that no other God or no other book has ever done, told the future with such accuracy. I've told you this a hundred times, and I'll tell you again. The, there's a book, I don't remember what, where it is, but the book of, there's a book of Mormon's books that says there was this great war up in Ed's, upstate New York and on this certain hill. And so archaeologists have gone and they've dug up and they've studied and they've done it and they've never found anything they said was there. They said there was a big war of like 5,000 men were killed and there was arrowheads and there were spears and all this. And it was with the Aztecs, even though the Aztecs didn't have metal and spears, but they say all this stuff. And they've found nothing. How many know that when the Bible says something and archaeologists or scientists say, oh, that's not true, like I'll give you an example. They'll say, hey, there's no such thing as Pilate. Nowhere in history can you find Pilate. It says Jesus stood before Pilate. You can't find Pilate. They said that. And then in 1962, they found the Pilate stone in Caesarea. You know, every time... The um, archaeology proves the Bible true, or not that the Bible needs to be proven, but it shows it. Never is it disproven. Always. They said, the walls of Jericho. Oh, the walls of Jericho. We can't find them. They found the walls of Jericho. It's the only book, and because only God knows the future. The Bible says he sees the beginning and the end. He sees, he doesn't live in time. He sees, he sees Adam and Eve right now, and he sees the end of the world right now at once. There is no time or future or past. And I mean, no, that's good. Because Jesus knows. I, I heard it this way. Can I just give you a free thing? I, may, I might be going long, but you can deal with it. Okay. If that means, so my wife has been diagnosed with cancer. But how I many know my, the Lord has seen that whole thing done? So he knows the solution. And we have to rest and trust in God that he knows the solution. He knows what he's doing. And we just have to trust what he's doing. He's not going, oh my goodness, what happened? Oh, golly, what do I do? I don't know. He doesn't go to, you know... Nebuchadnezzar's guys, he knows what's going on. We just have to trust him in this and see what he's doing because he sees the beginning and the end. What the Chaldeans are saying here also is that they have no communication with heaven or any God, true God. They even confess that their gods were not giving them any information, any real information. So they conclude their argument by saying there's no human being they can meet your demands, O king. There's nobody can do this. This is impossible. Don't you love God? Here I come to save the day. You know, I mean, I love that here comes Daniel going. You see the setup? It's just perfect, isn't it? And that's the way it should be for us. Now, as we see, saw last, next, or, this paves the way for next week. So come back next week. For, because next week we're going to see that Daniel comes on the scene and displays the awesome power of the one true God. He displays that God knows everything. God knows the beginning. And the end. That knowing this dream is no big deal for God. And he can tell him the dream. And he's going to tell him not just the dream, but the meaning of the dream. Amen. And how many know this? Hear this, guys. We need to get more prophetic. And I don't mean charismatic. Ooh, ooh. I mean, hear the voice of the Lord. Hear this. The Bible says, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Spirit is always speaking, 
The problem is you and I aren't listening. And now when I come to service, I, I mean, you know, maybe you go, that's weird. What do you do? He got up in the mic. He said kind of a little mini sermon. He goes, but how do you know we want to hear what the Spirit is doing in our lives? Through the word, but also through prophetic. And we want to hear that. And we want to be sensitive to that. And how do you know that, that, I mean, I can't tell you a million times how many times on the, on, just in workplaces, I would just have a word from God and just say it to someone. And they would go, whoa. I mean, simple things. Simple things you'd go, come on. One time I'm looking at this girl at a Bible study, and it was before I was married. But I was looking at this girl, and it's not because I liked her, but I was looking at this girl, and all of a sudden I saw her face just become empty. I saw literally her outside of her face, but her face just became a black hole. And I just went, wow, that is weird. And the Lord goes, go and tell her that. Okay. She's going to think I'm some psycho stalker, you know. <laughs> black hole, and I think, I can fill the hole. No, I mean, yeah, I was thinking, no, I don't want... So I go, okay. And there's the other thing, obedience. And I just said it to her. All of a sudden, she just starts weeping and weeping and weeping and went and was ministered to by girls. And she had just said how she had, the Lord had just revealed to her how she'd been molested as a child and how it just made her like this empty shell. And God was wanting her to confess that, you know, to get that out so she could be ministered to by the ladies of the church. How many like to walk in that more? And I hear this sadly, so you don't think I'm all that great. I used to walk into it, walk in it, but now I don't walk in it like I used to. What's happened? Is it God's problem or my problem? It's my problem. Because I'm so busy doing the ministry that I'm, hey, I'm busy. You know, and I need to say, Lord, speak. Because wouldn't you rather hear God speak through me than me try to speak? Some of you go, Amen, Amen, Amen. No, sorry. Pray then. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> as I said earlier at the beginning of this message, if you want to experience favor of God in your life, if you want strength in your life, and most of you raised your hand to that, did you not? You raised your hand for strength and for, 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 for favor. Then we need to be like Daniel and commit to put the Lord first. Amen. To put the Lord first in everything we do. And if we will do that, then we will see the mighty things that the Lord wants to do in and through us, just like we're going to see what he did through Daniel. But God, hear this. I wish I could say you can put everything else first and then put God later, but God is a jealous God, and he believes that he's worthy of being number one, not because like Oprah said, well, well, well he's just, I can't believe a jealous God. He's jealous because he knows he's really only the one that can satisfy you. All that stuff doesn't satisfy you. Rock stars would be the happiest people on the earth. But guess what? They're the most miserable. But I want to encourage you today that if you want that favor, you want that strength, then put the Lord first. Jerem or 2 Chronicles 16, 9 again. The eyes of the Lord search. The eyes of the Lord are right now looking at you, looking at me. And he says he is searching the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So God wants to strengthen. He's just asking for people whose hearts are fully committed to him. Amen? Amen? And then God also says, through Jesus, he said what? Seek first my kingdom and, and do your best to live right, commit to live according to my word, and all of these things shall be added to you. How, how much peace is that? If we ever needed that verse to be true in our lives, it's today in these tumultuous times. Will you bow your heads? If that is you today, and, and you're not just saying it to agree with me, but you're really humbly saying before God, you would say, Pastor Craig, will you pray for me? I really, I really do need that strength, and I really do want that favor of God in my life. If that is you today, would you just humbly raise your hand before him? God bless you. Amen. God bless you. And I just want to pray with you. Just agree with me as I pray for you. Just agree and just say, God, you know what? I, I don't bring much, but I bring my whole heart. And I commit to seek you first. Help me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for every hand that's raised. And even for those hands that aren't raised but should be. I pray, Lord, that you right now would just overwhelm them with your love that they right now would just be so encouraged and they would just not hear any condemnation from the devil. They wouldn't hear this, you haven't loved me, you haven't put me first. They wouldn't hear that because that's not you. 
but they would just sense your loving kindness. It says it's your kindness that leads them to repentance, leads them back. And I pray that your Holy Spirit right now would draw, draw us to just come to you. We love you because you first loved us. So God, draw, draw us to give you our whole heart, to give you our whole life because you're so good. And Father, help us as we do that to just all, just give them, each one of us, give us that peace which surpasses all comprehension. It doesn't mean instantly the cancer is gone or instantly the finances are healed, but I have a peace. Like the, the, the hymn writer said, it is well with my soul. Amen. Because God is in control and I've given God my whole heart and I've given, I put God in the driver's seat and put him number one and he promises that if I'll fully commit my life to him and my heart to him, he'll, he'll strengthen me and he promises to provide for me when I trust him like a little child. So God, some of us today need to become a child as you said, Jesus. Unless you become like a little one, like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Lord, it's not saying we should be childish, but it's saying a childlike trust that says my daddy's good and he loves me and he's for me and not against me. And so therefore I can give him my whole heart. I can put him first because God's got my back. Daddy's for me and not against me. Lord, let that truth just be seared in love into our hearts, into our minds. And may nothing this week steal that away. As you spoke to me once and you said, I pray for the day. My heart, Craig, is that you, the devil would never be able to turn you into my enemy or you, me into your enemy. And so, Lord, sometimes circumstances can challenge us to say, where is God? And the devil says, where is your God? And how could God allow this? And if God loved you, but I believe that the man or woman whose heart is fully committed to him, the man or woman who's seeking him first, will hear your voice above those others and will hear you say, son, daughter, I am for you and not against you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Rest in my love. Be still in my love. And know that I am God. And I'm in control of your life. And I'll take care of you. Bless your people. May these truths be true in us. In Jesus' most powerful name we pray. And everyone agreed said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. God loves you. Let's stand and worship him with all our heart.